Welcome to this presentation. Today we're going to talk about semicolons and colons. Um, so let's get started. Um, here we go. Here is our textbook. Um, I will have on the screen the fourth edition of the Aspen book, the one with the red cover. Um, but I will also be referencing the third edition of the Aspen book, which has the green cover. So if you have the red cover, we're going to be starting on page 51. Please follow along in your book, if you will. And if you have the green book, we will be um, on page 48. Okay. So let's get started. We're going to talk about colons first. Um, in this class, we don't do a lot with colons. The main thing that we do with colons is we indicate, um, oh, let's see, let me go ahead and pull this up here for a second. We um, close professional, I'm assuming, um, have as the end of our salutation a colon. That's the main purpose that we will talk about for colons. But there are other purposes, and it's a perfectly good uh, style of punctuation to use. Uh, people perceive of it as more formal than other types of punctuation. That, that is a characteristic it shares with the semicolon. Okay, so let's first of all talk about what a colon looks like. It is the two dots uh, stacked on top of each other. Um, if it's an emoticon, it's the two eyeballs, basically. Okay, um, so the first use that people oftentimes have for a colon is to introduce a list. So if you have several items, Bob is going to the grocery store. Um, for the, the, he might say that, um, to buy... Let's, say, let's put it this way. Bob is going to the grocery store to buy colon milk, comma, bread, comma, and eggs. That's um, one way of doing it. Many times that colon, though, is unnecessary. We can see here that if we were to remove the colon, I'm going to use a proofwriting symbol here, it would still work as a sentence. The defendant asserted the following three defenses, waiver, estoppel, and acquaintance. Now, probably the word following is more consistent with using the colon. Um, it, it's, it's not an item. I mean, you could still have following without using a colon, um, but, but the word following kind of tells you, hey, a list is about to come up. And when you are signaling that there's a list that's about to come up, um, many times people use a colon. Um, you can see in this list, um, the, the writer has chosen to separate these with a semicolon. We'll talk about this use in a few minutes. So that's one reason for a colon. We'll see in a couple minutes that there's a uh, little bit of danger. I said, this is a very dangerous grammar tool. <laughs> I don't want to scare you or anything, but there is the potential for danger here. So um, whenever you use a colon, I recommend uh, unless it's for this purpose. If you're using it for this purpose, then there's no, there's, there should be no fear involved. But if you're using it for any other purpose, well, for this purpose or for this purpose. Um, if you're using it for any other purpose, my suggestion would be to review the rules before you go ahead and commit to it because um, there's a lot of kind of picky rules about how you use a colon. It's easy to forget one of those picky rules, inadvertently use a colon where you shouldn't, and then you got egg on your face. So use a colon. You are empowered to do so. I think it's a cool piece of punctuation. Um, certainly you need it for this. Certainly you need it for this. But if you're using it for one of these other purposes, before you pull the trigger, just come to your Aspen book or Google it to make sure the particular way you're going to use it is okay. So we've talked about it, introducing a list, which is cool. Another is to clarify information. You can see here, we have instituted a new policy. And you can see the colon tells us, hey, wait a second, it's about to come. I'm about to say what the new policy is. There we have it. Um, so this is basically saying, pay attention, I'm about to say, I'm about to, to uh, give you that information that I've set you up for in the first half of the sentence. Then the next can be where, um, it, 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 alternatively here, you can use a comma, uh, but if you use a colon, it's a little bit more formal. It's a, making a little bit more of a big deal about it. Let's read this. This is when you're introducing a formal quote. 
but uh, one requirement for this is that this has to be a complete sentence before you can do that. You can see the court ruled against the defendant in unequivocal terms. You can see you could put a period here and it'd be a perfectly good sentence, but we're going to go on and have a quote. When you do that, you could do a comma, but um, actually, Hmm, I don't think you could do a comma in this case. I think you have to do the semicolon in this case when you really have a complete sentence other than the court ruled. Now, if you just had the court ruled, you could go with a comma here. But I think when you have this whole sentence, um, if you want to say this whole idea, this standalone idea, and you also want to marry it in the same sentence with the actual quote, I think you need to use the colon. Um, again, if you, uh, and this is a, a writing tip, you already know this, but let me just say it officially. When you find yourself in a situation where you are unsure about, hey, can I do that? Can I use a comma here? Can I use a semicolon here? Um, you have a couple of options. One is to Google the rule. Um, you can use your Aspen book. You can just Google it. Um, that is a very smart approach, and you will do that many, many times. Another approach to consider is to rewrite it so the problem, the particular strategy that you weren't 100% sure about, um, it no longer is necessary, that um, you are going to apply it in a different way. For example, let's say you have a very brief time and you need to get this filed. What you could do is you could keep this sentence. Let me just clear this out for a second. Is it was what you could do is you could replace this colon with a period and then say it stated or the court stated comma and you'd, you'd get to the same uh, point here. This is a comma, I know it's kind of crazy writing. So the court ruled against the defendant in unequivocal terms, period. The court stated, comma, liability is based upon this act of gross negligence. So when you are in a rush and you don't have time to, to actually confirm the rule, write it in a way that you know is gonna work. Uh, what you don't want to do, you, know, you have the two doors, research the rule, use it correctly, or rewrite it so you don't need to know that particular rule. Rely upon rules you already know. What you don't want to do is don't research it, but take that risky um, grammar rule, okay? So we've already talked, obviously, about uh, business letters. We have to always end a business letter with a colon. When we are writing personal letters, be they personal emails, love notes, thank you letters to great Aunt Mabel, whatever, we use a comma after it. Um, but when we are writing business letters, we use a colon here. This is a really important thing. When the reader gets this, this is one of the signals that tells him or her what's going to follow. When he sees a comma, he's thinking, oh, this is an invitation to a party, or this is a thank you note for that lovely gift. They, that person is not expecting a business communication. So you can see how you're getting off to that wrong step from the very, very beginning, and you've massively been unimpressive by using the wrong punctuation there. So this is an easy fix. Just this one step. If you don't learn anything else in this course, if you learn to do this and do this consistently, um, you have increased the professionalism of your business letters by a significant degree. So back yourself on the back. You're going to be able to remember this if you forget everything else in this course. If you drop the course tomorrow, you've gotten something of value out of this. Okay, so you do a colon in business letters. They say formal letters here, but really business letters, professional letters. It could be if you're writing to your granite Mabel a formal thank you letter because she uh, sent you a lovely present for your wedding, or for the christening of your child or something like that, you are not going to use a colon. You are going to use a comma because even though it's a formal document, I mean, pretty formal, it's a, a thank you note, um, you will be using a comma, okay? And then of course you already know this, between the hours and the minutes you use a colon. Okay, so we've talked about when we use colon, but now I'm gonna talk about the dangers associated with colon usage. Pretty scary stuff. You might want to sit down because it does get a little bit gruesome in the next few pages here. 
Okay. One thing to keep in mind is we're just going to put one space after the colon. I said before in a previous lecture that uh, once upon a time people would put two spaces between sentences. You can still do that if you want, or you can just stick with one space. One neat thing about using one space is you never have to remember there's a different rule because guess what? Everything else other than sentence space is a one space rule. So after the colon, you do one space. Um, and so you don't, if you just have that one space idea, you don't even have to remember this as a separate rule. If your second part isn't a complete sentence, you're not going to make a capital letter. And you can see here, after the colon in this case, we don't have a complete sentence, we just have a list of things. So we're not going to capitalize this W here, it has to be lowercase. In this case though, we do have a complete sentence. Goods may not be returned after 10 days. So we have the option, we can capitalize the G in goods or we can make it lowercase. We'll learn in a second that this has to be capitalized not because it's after the colon but because it's in quotations. So um, you have some options there. I would say most people prefer the capital letter in this situation, but um, reasonable minds can differ on that one. Obviously, you're going to want to be consistent. So if you don't capitalize it sometimes when it's a complete sentence, but do capitalize it other times in the same document, not, not so sharp looking. So be consistent however you approach it. Here are some times where you can't use a colon. Entering the courthouse were the judge, the marshal, and the bailiff. So we can't use it after a verb or after a preposition. And you can see why it's, this is the case because you don't have a complete sentence here. Entering the courtroom were, that's not a complete sentence. And remember that's one of the rules that we have for this. Um, in, sentences, in sentences, a colon is generally used after an independent clause, one that can stand by itself but this isn't an independent clause and it's not likely to be if it's right after, if the colon comes right after the verb or the preposition. You will hear the answer in, again, this isn't what you would call a complete sentence, therefore you shouldn't put the colon there. You don't even need any punctuation in, the, in, these, in these cases. So what I would recommend that you do is get rid of this. and get rid of this, and get rid of this. Okay, now we will talk in a few seconds about quotation rules, and I always debate about how much specificity to get into when we're talking about this, because, um, well, you'll see in a second why I'm concerned about this, but, but the bottom line is that when we have a colon, a colon isn't part of the quote. Now, of course, it's, if it's interior to the quote, like let's say the court actually had this sentence in its opinion, and so we're trying to put it in quotes. Well, obviously, we're gonna keep the quote just as it is. We're gonna keep that colon there, even if the colon is grammatically incorrect, because in most cases, you don't change grammatically incorrect quote. There are some times that you do, but as a general rule, you don't. So absolutely, you can do this. But you're not going to find that you have a colon at the end of a quote. Um, that wouldn't be a place that you would break off a, a quote. So you're not going to find that the final part of the quote that you're dealing with um, is going to have a, have a colon. If you choose to have a colon afterwards, the colon isn't part of the quote, you're using it for some other purpose. So here's an example of, of why you want to put the colon outside the closing quotes. The court referred to the three requirements for patentability and bed, as bedrock principles, novelty, usefulness, and non-obviousness. So you can see this uh, colon is really separate from this. We could have put bedrock principles earlier in the sentence. As bet, for example, the, 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 the we could have written it in this way. As bedrock principles, comma, the court referred to the three requirements for patentability as, uh, or actually this, as bedrock principles, comma, the court referred to the three requirements for patentability, colon. Then we'd have novelty, usefulness, and non-obviousness. So this goes outside, not inside. And when I say outside, I mean it goes, you put the, the closed quotes first, and then you put the colon.
Okay, so we are done with our discussion of colons. Again, remember, when you use a colon, unless it's for the close of a salutation or to reflect a time, you're going to want to make sure that you're using it appropriately. So check that book until you feel really, really confident about it. Other than these two times right here, these last two, you never have to use a colon. So if colons scare you, and I'll be honest with you, they can be rather frightening, um, you can uh, just say, I'm not going to use it for anything other than these two really, really safe times. Okay, so let's go on. This next piece of punctuation is a little bit less scary. Um, a little bit less thrilling perhaps, but it does have its uses. And in fact, in this course, we're going to use this device pretty often, or at least I use it pretty often. So let's talk about it. It's a semicolon. This is the uh, going to give you a wink. Um, you have a, a comma in the bottom part and then a dot at the top part, and you can see how it got its name. It's not quite a colon. It's kind of like a colon, but instead of having a period at the bottom, there's that comma or that wink, you might say. Okay, so let's look at the ways that we're might, gonna consider using a semicolon. Okay, um, there is no time in English that you have to use a semicolon. So if at the end of this discussion you say, I don't like it, I'm not gonna do it, I find it, it violates fundamental things about me that I don't want to violate, uh, then you can say goodbye to the semicolon and you can lead a happy and fulfilling life and never ever use a semicolon again. But I will tell you a couple of things. Number one, semicolon's a lazy person's grammar piece. It makes life easy. You maybe aren't lazy, I kind of am, and so I like to use it. So it can be a really useful piece. It's easier to use than some of the other devices that you'd have to use instead. The second reason that you may want to know about the semicolon is that other writers are going to use it. And so when you use it, you ought to know what the heck is going on here, because it's going to make you have a higher level of understanding about what is being said. So please don't be afraid. Have a, have a seat, and let's talk about the semicolon. Okay, the first one is uh, the main one, <laughs> the, the cool one. This is when you have two independent clauses. And when I say independent clause, I mean... Um, language that if you were to capitalize the first word and put a period after the the last word, you'd have a, a completely good sentence. That's what we say independent clauses. So two things that could be sentences um, back to back. And, you know, you, you are debating, well, how should I punctuate this? Well, you really have three options as to how you to punctuate it. But one of the options, again, this is the lazy person's option, so I'm all about this, is to put a semicolon between the two of them. So let's look how that works. We have here, that was his final summation. Complete sentence, you absolutely could put a period here, but we're not going to. Our second part, it was strong and forceful. Complete sentence, Com it, both are independent clauses. And you can see that they're logically related, it, where you're talking about the final summation in both parts, right? So it kind of progresses pretty easily. And so because they're closely related, because they're both independent clauses, instead of putting a period here or some other tool, we can just put a semicolon here, okay? Um, I'll do this about 400 times over the course of this semester. It's my favorite approach to these situations. It's very common uh, from a grammatical standpoint. Uh, but it's not the only way to fix it. So if you don't want to use a semicolon, I'm going to show you in just a couple minutes I don't want to build up too much ex excitement and too much anticipation, but there will be a big payoff later on, so just be ready for this, okay? But this is a tried and true approach. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Between two independent clauses joined by a transitional word or phrase such as however, for example, or therefore. This really isn't a separate rule, okay? Aspen is lying to you. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put it out there. Aspen is lying to you, okay? Because this is really just this rule. It's just talking about how to punctuate this rule. Okay, let's look at it again. We have our lovely independent clause. Let's just read it. The defendant was not credible. And we have another lovely independent clause. Therefore, the court voted, excuse me, the jury voted to convict her. And we've decided to punctuate them by putting a semicolon between. Oh, and by the way, there's just going to be one space here. Even if you are a two space between sentence kind of gal or kind of guy, you're just going to put one space here. And you are not, under any circumstances, going to capitalize the first word here. You'll end it with a period, but I suppose you could have a question mark there. 
Um, and so the only thing they're talking about here is it's not unusual to have some transitional word here. There's lots of different transitional words. We'll talk more about these when we talk about commas, and we'll talk about why we put a, a comma here. But this is all about comma instruction. Now, well, we haven't even gotten the comma, so don't worry about this as being a, a, one of the four paths to using a semicolon because it's really not its own path it's really just this path but yes if you are going to put a transitional word between our two independent clauses you absolutely can and you will have to put a comma okay let's go to the next to separate items in a list that is complex so that has commas let's look at this we have three items on this list item one item two and item three let's just look at these items okay Connie Rivers of Portland, Oregon. So we have somebody's name, a city, and a state. So we already are going to have a comma in the middle of one of our items in this list. Samuel Walter of Seattle, Washington, and Susan Stone of Boise, Idaho. Now we could have separated these three items on this list with a comma, but gosh, that looks really weird. We'd have Connie Rivers of Portland, comma, Oregon, comma, um, Samuel Walter of Seattle, comma, Washington, comma, and Susan Stone of Boise, comma, Idaho, period. That hurts my brain just to even think about that. Um, it might well be that the reader gets very confused. Even with the semicolons, it's a little bit confusing. I might choose to bullet this, actually, to make it even clearer. But you can see how when you have commas all over a list, using a semicolon lets the reader know, okay, this is one unit. And, oh, yeah, here's a second unit. And yet, here's a third unit. So if you're doing this, you want to use commas within a unit and a semicolon to break up the units. Okay? And then two separate items in a list introduced by a colon. And you can see here, this is, again, kind of a repeat of this rule, but it's a little bit different. As you can see in this example, we didn't use colons here. And why did we not? Well, we had a, ver, a, a were right here. So we did not really have a freestanding sentence here. Um, now, they had as follows here. Now, what do they just tell us about as follows? <laughs> They're such a liar fans here. I mean, I hope that you're as shocked by this as I am because we'll see here. Okay. Do not use a colon after the expressions, for example, namely, can, uh, including or such as. Um, I don't know, I guess maybe as false isn't technically part of that list, but I sure felt like in the spirit of it, I guess, um, anyway, I guess, I guess they're saying, I'm, okay, so maybe they didn't lie after all. Okay, I take it back. That was very mean of me. I'm a bad person um, for doing that. Okay, and somehow or another, because I'm a bad person, I have wandered off into a strange part of this book, and I can't get back. Okay, here we go. No, I don't want to do that. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know exactly what happened. But don't be afraid. This is going to be okay. I, I, I sense that things are going to work out for us. Okay, here we go. We're on page like 50-ish. Okay, so yeah, I impugned the author. I take it back. We're back on speaking terms, give or take. Okay, so here we are. Um, so we have the, four, the three items in the list, and you can see this is kind of involved. Let me just mark this up. I love this function here, by the way. You'll see me abuse it and use it way too much. Okay, so we have three items in the list. Yes, we could separate them with commas. You'll see in this example, there are no commas within the list. So we have one item on our list is the existence of a contract. The second item is the unjustified use, a breach of the contract by one party, and we have third damages caused by the breach. We have three items on the list. They could be separated by a comma, but when you have long-ish items, it's pretty common to use a semicolon. This, again, also would work as bullets, and of course, if you're having a bullet, you, would, you could have punctuation at the end of your bullet, or you wouldn't have to have any punctuation. You would uh, use bullets, you know, obviously. Um, so, um, but, but they're saying that with the 
a, a colon, it's more likely that you go ahead and use a semicolon. You don't have to. You could use a, a comma here. That would be A-OK -okay as well, but it's certainly a thing to use a, a, a semicolon under those circumstances. Going back to this example, I'm just going to sh share with you my thoughts. Um, here, yes, technically, as you can see in the rule we just discussed, you can use a semicolon here. But to me, that looks weird because these are really just very, I mean, one word items. And so I think a comma would be better. If this were three or four word long items, then I would say semicolon would be better. That's just my two cents, so to speak. Okay, now we're going to talk about, this is what I was building up to, we're ready for the big payoff. Have a seat, let me share some deep, deep wisdom with you. Okay, so we've been talking about when we have two independent clauses, what are we going to do? Well, there are three main strategies for it. Um, if you can commit these three strategies into your head or a dog ear the page of the book or whatever works for you this will save you a lot of sad moments in your life and we don't need any more sad moments than we absolutely have to so uh, consider this some free dear abby advice for you um, okay here we have the three approaches one is that we can break up our two independent clauses into two sentences and we all know how to do that where the independent first independent clause ends we put a period we do one or two spaces, depending on our preference, and then we capitalize the letter, the first letter of our second independent clause. Um, that is a very successful approach. There's no downside really to that. One of the things that we're signaling if we make them two separate sentences is we're saying that they're not super, super closely connected. Um, so that is, we're suggesting there's a little bit more separation between the, the ideas than we will with our uh, next two approaches. Okay, let's look at our next one, or let's look at our final one. This is the, the lazy person or lazy woman's, lazy man's approach. Same approach for the you know, first independent clause up until where we were using a period. And no, we're not going to do a period. We're going to do that semicolon. We're going to do one space. And here, look, we don't even have to capitalize the O here. So all we have to do is add a semicolon. We already had a space between these. And so it is the easiest fix. Um, the uh, so and what it signals to the reader is we have two quote unquote independent clauses or freestanding sentences, but they're super closely related, and also the writer is lazy. Those are the things we're letting the reader know. And if the sentences are closely aligned, it is a very very good choice. Okay. Um, then we have a third choice, and we call this the I call this at least the fanboy's choice. It's rule ten. If you were to flip to your um, commas section of this grammar book and what we do here is we have our first clause first independent clause we don't put a period we don't put a semicolon wait for it we put a comma a space we don't capitalize the first word of our second independent clause but we do need to have a fanboys in between here if you are unfamiliar with the term fanboys boy we have a treat for you in just a few weeks so uh, get ready for that it's going to be fun 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 times I hope that this presentation on colons and semicolons have been uh, useful to you. Thank you for your attention, and uh, please come back and visit us soon. Take care. Bye-bye.